Good morning. Uh, before I start, I would like to, again, for, for those of you who were not here yesterday, I would like to thank uh, Volodya Maikov for uh, his invitation that brought me here. It's a great pleasure for me to be back in Russia. I have been here about five times before. Many wonderful memories, uh, great friends here, and it's, um, it's always a pleasure to return. And I would also like to uh, thank uh, Volodya for everything he has done for uh, the development of transpersonal psychology in Russia and also uh, how he has represented Russian transpersonal psychology at, in many, many uh, international meetings. Okay, I would like to, to start actually in a somewhat unusual way, uh, the way I would do it in um, uh, California, and it might be completely inappropriate here, but I will take my chance. And if you find the question too personal, you just ignore me. And please don't uh, raise your hands until I finish this sentence. I would like to ask you, how many of you experience in your own uh, life, in everyday life, some powerful, non-ordinary states of consciousness? Uh, you have these different types uh, of experiences that I'm asking about. It doesn't have to be psychedelic experiences. Um, it can be participation in some shamanic uh, rituals. It could be um, participation in some powerful form of uh, experiential psychotherapy. It could be uh, things that happen during spiritual practice. It could be near-death experiences or uh, experiences that just happen. You don't ask for them. Uh, you don't do anything for inducing them. Uh, you might even be fighting them, and they happen anyway. So can I ask you, can I see the hands, how many of you I actually don't see you very well, unfortunately, but how many of you uh, uh, I can see quite a few. Um, the reason I'm, I'm asking this question is that what we will be talking about uh, is based on um, about 50 years of my work with these non-ordinary states. And it's much easier for people to relate to the material if they have some personal uh, experiences in that, in that area. And um, I have one more question. Uh, how many of you uh, experienced the holotropic breathwork that uh, my wife Christina and I developed? Okay. Uh, quite a few. Um, I mentioned uh, Valonia Maikov before. He has done the whole training with us and uh, became extremely accomplished in this area. He's not only offering workshops, but he's also offering uh, training for facilitators, for people who would like to uh, um, conduct uh, holotropic workshops, uh, holotropic sessions uh, themselves. So uh, now, now it's, uh, the whole training is available in uh, Russia. So those of you who become interested in this procedure, you will have a chance to, to experience it here. Uh, for me, this whole area um, of these non-ordinary states opened up when uh, I was a very young, beginning psychiatrist, and um, I volunteered for a session uh, with LSD, which was a substance that came from Sandoz Pharmaceutical companies to uh, the psychic de department where I was working uh, with a letter from, from Sandoz 
uh, telling us that this was a um, very interesting experimental substance that was discovered or the, the powerful psychoactive effects of this substance were discovered in the laboratories of Sandoz by Dr. Albert Hoffman, who actually intoxicated himself uh, when he was synthesizing this uh, substance. It's a very, very wonderful story. He, he was working with the substance. He suddenly started having very unusual uh, feelings, powerful emotions, started seeing colors, started seeing visions, and um, initially was concerned that he was going crazy. And then when he came back after about two hours, he thought there must be some better explanation and came to the conclusion that maybe he somehow intoxicated himself by the substance that he was working with, although he, he couldn't imagine how that could have happened. Uh, you know, he's a very, very proper Swiss professor, chemist, because you, you work with uh, uh, rubber gloves, you don't lick your fingers when you work with new substances. Uh, so it was not clear how, how it could have happened. Today he thinks that maybe at one point his eye was itching and that he actually touched his, his uh, eye. And the substance is so powerful that the, the, the quantity, the absolutely minuscule quantity that was somehow brought into the conjunctival sac was enough to change his consciousness for two hours. And then he decided to uh, actually deliberately repeat this uh, experiment. And um, several days later, took what he considered himself again, um, you know, absolutely minimal dose of uh, the substance to test whether it is possible that this was caused by um, the chemical that he was working with. And uh, what he considered at the time, the, the absolutely minimal dose was 250 micrograms, which is millionth of a gram. Uh, for those of you who cannot relate to that number, this is a, uh, an amount of the substance that later when we worked clinically with LSD, we would consider to be a high dose uh, that required like several hours of preparation of people. Uh, we had a team of um, usually men and a woman staying with the person the whole time and then keeping them overnight and then talking with them um, to be sure that they were okay and sending them home. He took it very casually because it was actually uh, only 25% of the dosage of these um, ergot alkaloids of that category of substances that are normally used. So he thought he was on a very, very safe side. And of course, um, within 45 minutes that condition returned, but this time it was, uh, the, the intensity was enormous. He couldn't continue to work. Uh, he asked his assistant to, uh, to take him uh, home. And this was in uh, wartime when uh, there was a restriction on the use of cars and people were using bicycles. And there is this wonderful description of Albert Hoffman uh, bicycling through the streets of Basel um, under the influence of 250 micrograms of this substance. Uh, uh, when he arrived home, he thought he was dying. He thought his neighbor was a witch and was bewitching him, was, was hexing him. And he asked the assistant to uh, call uh, the doctor and when the doctor arrived he was not dying anymore now he was a newborn baby he was reborn and he felt wonderful and ended up in a, in a very very good place where he had 
the feeling that a lot of his problems in life got resolved and uh, that this was the beginning of a completely new phase in his life. Uh, he wrote a report to his boss, Dr. Stoll, and um, the son of uh, his boss happened to be a psychiatrist in Zurich, and they asked him if he would like to conduct a study with the substance, what we call a pilot study. And uh, Dr. Stoll did it, the young Stoll, and published this paper, and this overnight became a sensation. And now uh, Sandoz was sending samples to different universities, research institutes, even individual therapists, um, asking them if they would uh, like to work uh, with the substance and let them know, let Sandoz know, if there was a leg legitimate uh, use. Uh, so we got a large sample, my preceptor got a large sample of LSD and I became one of the early uh, volunteers in this work and I had an extremely powerful mystical experience, experience of cosmic consciousness and this uh, created in me a lifelong interest in uh, these non-ordinary states of consciousness or uh, holotropic states of consciousness, as I, as I call them. Uh, so I would like to show you a, a few pictures that sort of accompany what I was just describing. Uh, this is the, the picture of Dr. Hoffman at the time when he made this discovery. This was a picture that was um, shown all over the world. And, uh, you know, different uh, newspapers, journals, uh, and so on. This is um, uh, my visit with Dr. Hoffman, which uh, was quite a few years ago, in his beautiful house, which is on the French-Swiss border. And uh, the, the two women that you uh, can see in the, in the middle, this is Christina, this is my wife. And um, on the other side is Anita. She is the, the wife of uh, Albert Hoffman. And this is a, a situation where we, uh, at an, uh, on another occasion, we brought uh, uh, Hans Ruhe de Giger uh, to uh, the Hoffmans. And you will see in the slideshow that we'll be showing, you will see some of his paintings. He is. Uh, really brilliant Swiss painter and uh, you might know him as somebody who received an Academy Award, uh, the Oscar, for uh, designing the, uh, the monster in uh, the movie The Alien and also some of the other uh, aspects of the, of the movie. And here is um, Hans Rudi Giger with his wife Carmen, and masks that they uh, that he designed. And in the background, you can see his one of his paintings, um, and it gives you a sense of the size of uh, the paintings that he makes. He, he works with uh, with an airbrush. And this is a visit in his home. On the left side is uh, uh, Richard Tarnas, who is a close friend of mine, a brilliant psychologist and also uh, astrologer, who um, published two books that are bestsellers uh, in the United States and other places. One is called The Passion of the Western Mind, the history of European thought from pre-Socratics to postmodern time. And the second that came, several, uh, came out several months ago is uh, specifically dedicated to uh, astrology of history, and it's called uh, Cosmos and Psyche, which I really recommend to, to um, everybody. It's a very, very serious piece. It's not the kind of astrology you find in uh, magazines or newspapers. He spent 30 years uh, doing historical research and writing this book. 
And of course, on the other side is Hans Rudi Giger, and uh, there is a furniture that he designed originally for the movie that was called Dune. Uh, now, this is a visit in his house. He, as a as a child, he loved uh, ghost rides, and in his house today, in the garden. He created a, a, a railroad uh, that sort of winds through the garden, goes through tunnels and so on. And as you uh, take the ride, then uh, there are his sculptures. Uh, a lot of, uh, you see a lot of images of fetuses, uh, demonic women and so on, uh, that you, you will again later see in the slideshow when I will uh, explain what they are about. So this is when he took me for a ride uh, on this little train. And these are the kinds of things that you see when you take the ride. Tunnels, of course. Um, uh, Hans Ruedin and um, I became close close friends. I'm currently uh, writing a book trying to show how the new expanded cartography of the psyche that we'll be talking about helps to understand uh, his art, which is very frequently uh, misunderstood and, and attacked by a number of people. And he allowed us to conduct one of the um, what we call modules, uh, one of the uh, training units uh, uh, for facilitators of holotropic breathwork in his museum, which is in Gruyere in, in Switzerland, a little, little town. Um, he bought a whole wing of that castle, and there is his museum currently. And he allowed us to use the last floor of his um, um, museum uh, for holotropic breathwork. This module was called uh, Fantastic Art. And uh, we actually invited Albert Hoffman, who spent a day with us in that module. And uh, what you see here is uh, uh, Hans Rudi Giger is now uh, doing a kind of sightseeing tour for, for uh, Albert Hoffman. This is in front of uh, Hans Rudi Giger's uh, museum. On the left side is Tef Sparks, who is a senior staff member who is now conducting the training modules all over the, all over the world and will be also coming to, to Russia. And on the right side is, is Carmen, very beautiful wife of uh, Hans Rudi Giger who uh, also did the whole training, so she's also uh, a breathwork facilitator. And this is when we are saying goodbye after this uh, module. This was in September, and then I returned uh, to Switzerland, to Basel, in January, the following January, uh, to celebrate uh, Dr. Hoffman's 100th birthday. He's now 102 years old. Uh, so this is the two of us uh, during that uh, large celebration which was happening in Basel in uh, the museum there. So uh, these are, these are the, uh, the pictures uh, sort of illustrating what I said before. That, that powerful experience which I had, that, that experience of cosmic consciousness created in me a lifelong interest in uh, these, uh, these holotropic states and these non-ordinary states. And uh, what you see on the screen are the different uh, areas that I have been interested in during these 50 years. Uh, about half of the year, uh, half of the uh, time was clinical research with uh, psychedelic substances first in uh, the research institute in Prague, and then uh, I emigrated to the United States. 
where for several years I uh, was uh, leading the last surviving uh, research project of uh, the exploration of psychedelic substances in uh, United States in the Maryland Psychedelic Research Center. Uh, then um, in the second half of this time, uh, my wife, Christina, and myself developed this method of uh, holotropic breathwork where a very similar spectrum of experiences can be induced by very simple means, by uh, somewhat accelerated breathing, a certain kind of attention uh, to the inner process, uh, powerful evocative music, and uh, a certain kind of body work that we uh, develop. Uh, then we also for a while worked with um, sensory deprivation, which is uh, the method that uh, was primarily developed by John Lilly, who was also known as somebody who studied the intelligence of uh, dolphins. And uh, we had a tank that he built in our research institute where uh, you could actually was completely submerged underwater, uh, have a mask with a pipeline to get air, and uh, you would be suspended like a fetus in darkness in water, which was the temperature of your of your body, no sounds, completely deprived of any sensory input, and you could spend many hours in that um, medium and uh, have powerful experiences without substances, just through the sensory deprivation. Uh, Volodya Maikov just told me that I think yesterday or several days ago, uh, um, the first uh, center was, was created in Moscow where people can have the experience with this sensory deprivation uh, tank. And then there was, there was another area where um, I was very much involved uh, and Christina was involved. And this was working with people who had episodes of non-ordinary states uh, spontaneously in the middle of their everyday life. Um, people who normally would be uh, diagnosed as psychotic, they would be put on tranquilizers, they would be very likely hospitalized. And um, we uh, came to the conclusion on the basis of the work that we did uh, with first with psychedelics and then with the breath work that actually there's a significant number of these kinds of uh, states uh, which are really crisis of spiritual opening or transpersonal crisis. Um, and we started calling them spiritual emergencies. Um, there's, a, there's a kind of a uh, play on words there because emergency in, uh, in English means a, a, a critical situation. It is something that emerges uh, and creates a crisis, but of course emerging from the uh, Latin uh, emergere also means uh, rising, uh, you know, emerging, rising, in this case rising to a new level of uh, uh, consciousness. So uh, what is meant by that term is that these situations are a problem, can create a crisis, but there's also an opportunity if they're properly understood, if they are properly supported, that they can be actually healing, they can be uh, transformative, they can even be uh, evolutionary. And then besides, I, I have been interested in uh, number of uh, other situations and the common denominator is always they involve these uh, uh, holotropic states of consciousness. They have a lot of contact with anthropologists. I wanted to know what they experienced when they were doing field work with native cultures. Uh, I also had a lot of uh, connection with uh, various shamans myself with shamans in South America, in uh, Mexico, Central America, North American shamans. Uh, we visited uh, shamans uh, 
of the Ainu people in, in uh, northern uh, Japan. Uh, we had connection with uh, shamans of the Australian uh, Aborigines and so on. Uh, I myself participated in uh, ceremonies uh, with native uh, tribes, um, with, um, you know, with peyote, with, with ayahuasca, with uh, sacred mushrooms of the, of the Mazatecs. Um, I have had a lot of contact with people who were Tibetan teachers, uh, yogis, uh, uh, Christian mystics such as, uh, such as Brother David Steinler Rast or uh, Father Beat Griffith. Um, done work with people who had um, uh, experiences of UFO abduction. Uh, experiences uh, and you know spiritual spiritual teachers uh, of different cultures. So uh, after this experience, um, this powerful mystical experience, the study of these uh, these non-ordinary states really became my uh, my profession, my vocation, uh, my passion. Uh, now, I'd like to uh, emphasize one thing in this particular um, context because I have had very bad experiences with that. And that's, uh, as you can see, I have been interested in the whole spectrum of these non-ordinary experiences. And uh, I was introduced into this area um, through my psychedelic experience and psychedelic research. But uh, wherever I come, the journalists usually focus on that aspect of psychedelics as being the most sensational. Uh, so, for example, when I came to, the, to Russia last time, um, a journalist or pseudo-journalist, uh, Alyona Antonova, uh, wrote a, an article, LSD propagandist uh, visit, visits Russia and then she uh, fabricated a whole interview with me, although I never talked to her, again focusing on LSD. So um, I would like to emphasize you know, that we are talking about the whole spectrum of these experiences. I am not a propagandist of, uh, of uh, psychedelics, although I believe that properly used, they are very useful tools. I would like them to return to um, people to professionals who can use them uh, responsibly. But my interest is much, much broader. And uh, what interests me particularly is that the experiences and the observations which were done during the era of psychedelic research uh, ask for a profound revolution, changes in psychology and psychiatry in psychotherapy, you know, certain observations were made that cannot be explained by current uh, conceptual frameworks and uh, should be taken into consideration whether or not psychedelics themselves will, will uh, uh, return. Okay. Now, before we go to the subject of this talk, which is the, the roots of human uh, violence and uh, human greed, you know, obviously extremely, extremely uh, important subject if you, if you look at the current situation and the global, global crisis that we are all facing. Uh, so before we go into the observation that specifically uh, relate to these two forces, destructive forces in human nature, I would like to share with you uh, the, the new model, the new uh, cartography of the psyche that emerged out of this, uh, out of this work. Uh, current uh, academic psychiatry and psychology uses a very narrow, very superficial model of the psyche which is basically limited to, uh, to postnatal biography. There's the idea that somehow 
the uh, psychological history of an individual begins after we are born. Freud described uh, the newborn baby as tabula rasa, which means um, um, sort of uh, like uh, washed or erased uh, blackboard, a, a clean slate. You know, there's nothing there. And what we be become depends on uh, what kind of uh, nursing we had, what kind of relationship with our mother, then later uh, the situation in the nuclear family, uh, especially the what's called the Oedipal triangle, you know, the relationship with the father and the mother and so on, and, and the events later in life. Uh, then uh, there's also uh, the concept of the unconscious that's used in, in academic psychiatry, but what is meant by it is Freud's individual unconscious, which is also a, a derivative of postnatal biography. You see, things that we have forgotten, things that we have repressed, things that were unacceptable. And we have also the, the, the concept that if you develop some uh, emotional and psychosomatic problems that do not have any biological causes, that they are not organic, as we call it, that they should be completely, fully understood just from your postnatal history, from what happened to you as, a, as an infant, as a baby, and then later, later in life. And this cartography had to be radically, radically expanded because you simply cannot understand what's happening in these states, in these holotropic states, uh, when you are using this, this very narrow, very superficial uh, model of the psyche. Um, so I made myself a, an effort, took about three years of uh, the psychedelic research where I, I was mostly running two sessions a day. Uh, I was so excited about this work that I got up early, got into the research institute, started a session, and then uh, in the afternoon I ran another session and went uh, home late, uh, late at night. And I was so fascinated by the fact that so many new things were emerging from the psyche that were not really accounted for in, in current psychiatry. And uh, at the time I thought I was creating a, a new, um, new model of the psyche, which was made possible uh, by the fact that we got a powerful new tool. Like uh, when microscope was uh, discovered, a whole new uh, world was discovered, a new, you know, new uh, area of research. The same with the telescope. And I believe that we, we had a tool here that was something like the microscope or telescope for, for psychiatry. And uh, I thought I was creating a, a new uh, cartography of the psyche. It took me three years to really uh, create a map where all the major categories of these experiences were accounted for, were properly placed. And uh, as I was co um, completing this psyche, I realized this was not a new map at all. It was actually a very old map of the psyche uh, that has existed in a number of different cultures, a number of different uh, uh, spiritual systems. Uh, parts of it uh, were known to the shamans. Uh, significant aspects of that map were covered in the great spiritual philosophies and, and religions of the East, in, in um, um, the different systems of yoga, different schools of Buddhism, in Taoism, in Sufism. Uh, many of those experiences were described by uh, Christian mystics and so on. So basically what, what happened, you know, instead of having uh, this historically completely new cartography of the psyche, uh, suddenly uh, there was a, 
rediscovery of an ancient understanding, a perennial uh, understanding of the psyche, but discovered through modern means and uh, reformulated theoretically uh, in, in uh, the terminology of, uh, of the 20th, uh, 20th century. So uh, there was this large, large, vast map that in addition to uh, what's already known and accepted in uh, uh, psychiatry, which means the biographical level, the postnatal biography, we can say the biographical recollective level, uh, I added two large uh, um, regions. Um, the first of them I called perinatal. The term perinatal uh, is actually used in obstetrics. Peri means around, like if you say the periscope, it means something that makes it possible for you to look around. So peri means around, and uh, natal is uh, related to the Latin natalis, which means uh, pertaining to childbirth, or being related to childbirth. So we use the term in medicine um, for issues related to birth, the situation preceding birth, associated with birth, and following birth. Uh, but it's used only for material processes, perinatal hemorrhage, perinatal uh, brain uh, damage, perinatal infection. You never hear uh, the term perinatal used in connection with consciousness because uh, current belief in uh, uh, psychiatry, in medicine, is that there is no consciousness uh, in uh, the newborn baby. In, uh, there is no experience of birth. And actually, that the, the memory of birth is not recorded anywhere, which is uh, unbelievable if you think about it, that there is general agreement among psychiatrists that nuances of nursing are very important, which is a situation that immediately follows birth, but a process that could be life-threatening or is potentially life-threatening, birth, that can last, uh, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 hours uh, where um, the child can lose life, the mother can lose life, uh, the child can be born dead and have to, has to be resuscitated. Current psychiatry does not consider to be a psychotrauma. Uh, the only way I can understand is that there is a tremendous uh, repression there, that, that the memory of that event is so scary that we do everything we can to deny it. The usual story that you hear is that um, uh, there couldn't be any memory of birth because the, uh, the cortex of the, of the brain of the child is not, uh, is not really completed in that the, the neurons are not completely covered by a fatty substance which is called myelin. This process is called myelinization. So uh, the, the idea that because the brain is not, the cortex is not myelinized, uh, there cannot be any record of all these hours of the struggle in the birth canal, uh, which is absolutely bizarre because on the other hand we know that memory exists in species that don't have any cortex at all. Uh, actually that it, it is a property of, of protoplasm. Several years ago a Nobel Prize was given to Eric uh, Kandel for uh, his study of memory mechanisms in a sea slug, in a sea snail, <laughs> you know, a very, very primitive organism. So sea snails have memory according to current science, but the very complex brain of the newborn supposedly does not have the property to record birth. Now the work with these non-ordinary states uh, corrected this error. It showed that we carry very, very powerful 
record of all the stages of, of birth and even prenatal state. So this was that one uh, level which uh, I added to the cartography, perinatal level. And then the perinatal level actually functions as a kind of a doorway into the next domain, which also is not recognized by uh, current uh, academic psychiatry, which we now call transpersonal, transcending the personal, going beyond the personal. And uh, in that domain, you can have experiences, for example, of your own boundaries melting and you become identified with another person. Or you can have experience of, a, of consciousness of a whole group of people. You can have the experience of becoming all the children of the world or all the mothers of the world. Uh, you can actually identify experientially with animals, with different species, and you can, through that experience, very authentic experience, you can actually learn new things about those uh, different species, uh, which goes way beyond anything that you ever knew intellectually. Another uh, very, very interesting characteristic of this transpersonal area is that it can take you into history, not just your own history, into childhood, infancy, birth, and prenatal, but it can take you to um, experiences of your ancestors, experiences of your animal ancestors. It can take you into a realm that Carl Gustav, Gustav Jung described as the historical collective unconscious where the whole history of humanity is recorded and uh, it can also take you into a domain uh, where you encounter phenomena that uh, current science would consider to be non-existent, unreal. It takes you into uh, mythological realms and encounters with mythological figures, and again you can experience mythological figures or visit mythological realms uh, which you have never heard about intellectually. Now, this is what, what uh, led Carl Gustav Jung, you know, amazing revolutionary in psychology, to the assumption that we do not have just a Freudian individual unconscious, derivative of our postnatal history, but we have this collective unconscious, the historical, which records the history of the human species, and also uh, the archetypal, the, the mythological. So the, the perinatal uh, level represents also a kind of a very specific opening into this collective uh, unconscious. Now, when people regress to, to this perinatal level, they start reliving their birth, uh, the experiences come in four uh, constellations or patterns, or uh, I call them matrices, basic perinatal matrices. And this is what we will be talking about, and we will also see in pictures. Um, you know, there is the best way of learning something about these holotropic states, of course, is to have the experiences. The second best is to be able to see the art that comes, people who are capable of portraying those experiences, because that addresses uh, our right hemisphere. The least effective way of learning about these um, holotropic states is uh, hearing about them. Uh, so uh, this is why, why we will use the slideshow to really get, uh, you know, get you a good, good cellular sense of what these experiences are uh, about. So these are now images of the stages of birth that uh, underlie, that are related to uh, the experiential matrices, the basic perinatal matrices. So when I say basic perinatal matrices, what I mean is the 
the clusters of experiences that you would have when you are reliving that particular stage of the, the birth process. So just very, very quickly, a few sort of anatomical, physiological comments that will then um, help you understand better the symbolism which is uh, uh, associated with it. And then, you know, after we finish the slideshow, we will then uh, relate it to uh, the subject of this uh, method. And I will show you parallels between the images that people draw when they are reliving birth and uh, posters and cartoons from the time of wars. How this material really gets projected into um, the ways um, countries that are enemies portray each other. So what we see uh, in, the, in the first picture, on the first matrix, is the situation of uh, the fetus in an advanced stage of pregnancy prior to the onset of the delivery. Here, uh, this could be a very beautiful state when the mother is healthy, uh, the mother is in a good uh, condition, emotional condition, physical condition, is in a decent marriage, uh, the child was wanted, and so on. All the circumstances are right. Uh, but this is not always the case. Sometimes the pregnancy can be uh, a result of a rape. It could be a result of a one-night stand when you know both partners were drunk and just happened to have sex. Uh, the mother could be very sick, could have a, what's called toxicosis, you know, toxic uh, uh, condition. Um, the child could be very unwanted, and there could actually be attempt at. Abortion. We have worked uh, work with people where there were sometimes repeated attempts to abort the child and uh, the, the fetus managed to survive it and people carry it as a, as a very profound uh, trauma. There's also another situation uh, which creates a very bad womb, um, very bad prenatal state, uh, which is uh, what's called RH incompatibility, which is an immunological situation when uh, the mother is what's called RH negative and the child is RH positive. Uh, as, the, as the fetus is growing inside of the mother, the maternal organism actually starts developing antibodies, starts attacking the, the child. And with each pregnancy, the, the level of these antibodies is increasing. And when uh, it's advanced, when it's uh, more pregnancies, then the situation can be such that the child actually doesn't survive. We have worked with people, one, one woman I remember, uh, where she was the third child when the, the tighter, you know, the level of the antibodies is extremely high, but she managed to survive it and had to do a lot of inner work to deal with these traumatic uh, prenatal uh, experiences. Now, um, with each contraction, uh, the uh, placentary circulation is interrupted, so the child is not getting any oxygen, there's no nourishment coming in, and the toxic metabolic products are not removed. It's a very, very uncomfortable situation for the, for the fetus during the contractions. Besides the mechanical pressures and the discomfort, uh, there's also uh, the situation of the suffocation, which is, which is very, very uh, difficult. Uh, now, whether or not this was a good uh, or bad womb, you know, come nine months, plus minus, the, the delivery starts. First, hormonal changes, and these are then translated into these periodic 
contractions, creating a very uncomfortable uh, situation for the baby. Then with each contraction, the, the cervix is being pulled over the head until it is dilated, as it is called. And then it's, it moves to the next stage where the contractions continue. But this time, it's not a no exit situation, but it's a very difficult struggle, progression, propulsion through the, through the birth canal. An important thing to, to realize that besides the, the, uh, you know, the pressure and uh, all the problems that can be there, for example, the umbilical cord around the, uh, the neck or the umbilical cord getting between the head and the side of the birth canal, compressing it um, and you know, creating further um, suffocation beyond those created just by the contractions. Uh, there's a very interesting aspect of this stage, which is if we can judge from the reliving of this situation that we do as adults, there is a, a very powerful sexual kind of energy which is generated by the pain and by the suffocation. Uh, this is closely related to uh, certain sexual practices sadomasochistic practices where people actually are trying to recreate the situation by, um, by um, wanting to be bound, wanting to be choked in a sexual situation and experience that combination of this tremendous discomfort and sexual arousal. So there is a sexual component. You will see that in the, in the pictures. Um, now this is a very... <laughs> shocking sort of a discovery. Uh, you know, it was bad enough when Freud uh, came with the, with the uh, idea that sexuality does not, uh, does not start in puberty, but that it really starts um, after we are born uh, on the breast with the oral uh, sexuality and then the um, anal and uh, urethral and phallic uh, sexuality in childhood. These, these observations are telling us that we had the first sexual experience um, before we even came into the world. Now, the, the interesting thing is that what this means that our first encounter with this sexual type of energy happens in a very precarious situation. When we uh, experience um, pain inflicted on us by another organism. We also cause pain to another organism, our mother. We uh, uh, experience tremendous discomfort. We are choking. We experience pain. And we are also encountering different forms of uh, biological material. The uh, amniotic fluid, the uh, vaginal secretions, blood, and if there was no enema, if there was no um, catheter, uh, there could even be uh, feces and, and urine in the situation. Uh, so um, we have found out that this becomes, this combination becomes then in connection with some postnatal experiences, becomes the basis of various sexual aberrations. Uh, you know, sexual dysfunctions, uh, sexual perversions, and so on. Uh, so now, uh, in this situation, unlike in the previous one, we are not completely uh, hopeless. We don't have the sense of no exit. There is a sense that uh, the situation is very very difficult, very painful, but that somehow if we continue, we can sort of liberate uh, ourselves. And then uh, there's a situation where uh, the, the child is delivered, either head first or feet first, uh, depending on circumstances. And then the umbilical cord is cut either instantly or when it, start, when it stops pulsating or somewhere in between, 
This depends on the circumstances and also the philosophy of the obstetrician. So this is the anatomy physiology of this process. Now each of these stages in holotropic states can be experienced as a concrete memory. You can literally feel like the child in the womb. If it's the first matrix, you can feel or even taste the amniotic fluid. You can experience the connection with the mother and so on. Um, when it is, uh, let's say, the transition between the uh, third and the fourth stage, uh, you can discover that you were born with the umbilical cord around the neck, or uh, you can experience the forceps if there, that was caused. We have even seen uh, bruises appearing on the head of people, although nobody was touching them, and they were not touching anything. Bruises appeared, uh, quadrangular, just in the shape of the, of the uh, forceps that was applied. So there's a real cellular memory of that situation. Now, in addition to this uh, concrete memory of being a fetus going through these different stages, each of those uh, perinatal matrices has also a certain symbolic uh, language. And this is what we will see, certain visions, uh, certain physical sensations which are associated with it and so on. So if you are reliving a situation of being in a good womb, in a good prenatal state, um, the experience of being a fetus in a very, very positive uh, uh, prenatal state, you can suddenly find yourself in the ocean. You can go from fetal state into an oceanic state and you can identify with various aquatic animals. It can also open into a cosmic space. We have people uh, who identified with astronauts on, or we would say cosmonauts, uh, on spacewalk. You see, floating in space, connected with the pipeline, with the mother ship, as we call it, uh, in this weightless, weightless condition. It can also open into scenes of nature, mother nature, nature that's beautiful, safe, and unconditionally nourishing, the way um, a good mother would be nourishing the, uh, the fetus. And it can also open into the collective unconscious, where suddenly from a beautiful prenatal condition, you can find yourself in paradise of a particular culture or in a state that you experience as heaven. And again, different cultures have different forms of paradise and different uh, specific forms of heavens. And you can experience actually culture-specific paradises and heavens, even if you intellectually don't know anything about those mythologies. Yesterday I gave that example of one of my clients who had the experience of the Eskimo paradise in, in the luster of the Aurora Borealis and so on. If you're experiencing, re-experiencing a bad womb, in many instances uh, the, this, the prenatal disturbances are chemical, toxic uh, states, so uh, you would feel poisoned you might have uh, a sense of connection with some very insidious evil forces, demonic uh, forces. Uh, if um, there was an attempt at abortion, for example, with some mechanical way, it can be experienced as a, as a kind of apocalyptic, you know, bloody catastrophe and so on. The transition from one to two is typically experienced as uh, a sense of being devoured, being engulfed, either by some archetypal monster like Leviathan or a dragon, uh, or uh, you can have uh, the experience of a whirlpool uh, as journey into the underworld. Yesterday we talked about the different forms of these uh, 
journeys, for example, the shamanic initiatory journey, the visionary experience of going into the underworld. Uh, I think I mentioned Odysseus visiting, uh, I mentioned Inanna, the Sumerian goddess, visiting the, the underworld, Orpheus visiting uh, uh, this. In Steppenwolf, you have, uh, in Hermann Hesse, you have this idea of the magic theater and so on. Uh, you have the story, the biblical story of Jonah being swallowed by the big fish and retained and then regorged again. The uh, story of Saint Margaret being swallowed by the dragon, you know, uh, all the way to fairy tales to the uh, Red Riding Hood, which is, uh, swallowed by the wolf and then, uh, then released. Those are all really powerful perinatal motifs that you find in, uh, in art, in literature, in, in religion, and so on. Now, a fully developed second matrix uh, on the deepest archetypal level feels like hell. Being in hell, being in a state of, of great uh, emotional and physical suffering and not being able to see any way out. Um, you know, these four matrices can be really directly related to Dante's Divine Comedy, uh, where um, the second matrix would like hell, uh, the third matrix would be like a purgatory, suffering with perspective, hell is suffering without perspective, uh, the, the third matrix suffering with perspective, purgatory, and then you have uh, the uh, the situation of uh, you know of um, uh, psycho spiritual rebirth and reaching a state which then would return to the first matrix paradise heaven and so on um, in Dante's Divine Comedy when uh, they are entering um, hell so there is a, an inscription. Uh, lasciate ogni speranza voi che entrate. Abandon um, hope, any hope, uh, you who enter here. Okay, so this is a, the second matrix is a sense uh, of hopelessness, of no exit. Uh, the third matrix is a situation of a, a very difficult state, but a state that in some sense is workable, there is a, a possibility of way out. And while in the second matrix, we uh, identify only with the victim, in the third matrix, we can be in three roles. We are the victim, but we can also identify with the aggressor, in some sense with the, with the birth canal that is doing this to us. And we can also become a witness who is just simply observing that situation. So let's say if you would have the experience of a concentration camp in the second matrix, you would be the inmate. You would be the prisoner. If you would have the image of the concentration camp in the third matrix, you would uh, feel what it is like to be the victim, the prisoner, but you can also become the the couple, you can also become the, the violent aggressor, and you can also just be an, an observer who sees that whole, whole situation. Uh, now in uh, the third matrix, the imagery would be uh, powerful clashing energies, uh, images of some bloody battles, um, battles where there is entanglement when you have equal uh, chance to hurt and to be hurt in the same way in which the mother is hurting the child, the child is hurting the, uh, the mother. So uh, I don't know what movies I would mention that you, would, you have seen here that you recognize, but something like El Cid, you know, when you have two medieval armies that sort of clash and then they all get entangled and, uh, you know, everybody is chopping and, and getting chopped and there is blood all over the place. Uh, another movie was Mel Gibson's Brave, you know, Braveheart and so on. 
uh, also the uh, images of, let's say, um, First World War, when there were attacks on the trenches with bayonets, where people <laughs> sort of poking each other, attacking each other, hurting each other, uh, gladiator combats. Again, you know, really, it's not a, it's not a battle where you shoot people at a distance, uh, a sniper or something like this. It's, a, it's really this, this, this violent entanglement. So a lot of those kinds of images, a lot of very, very unpleasant negative sexual images with this, those kinds of combinations that I already described. So it would be red light districts, it would be uh, various uh, um, you know, aberrations, uh, uh, perversions, and so on. Uh, there is also, um, as you are moving, moving uh, out, uh, the, the images are getting lighter, and you can experience uh, a combination of uh, religious or spiritual themes and um, sexuality. For example, many of the native ceremonies are very are spiritual but are very sensual, sexual, or something like uh, phallic worship or, or uh, fertility rites or, or temple prostitution, those kinds of images. And then there is, as, as you come to the very end, uh, many people experience encounter with some very unpleasant material. I talk about is this scatological. Uh, stage. Skatos means uh, dung or uh, excrement and so on. And then uh, coming out, many people encounter fire. They have the feeling that their body is on fire, they're passing through fire. Uh, the fire feels like purifying fire. You know, in some languages, uh, the term for purgatory involves actually uh, uh, fire. In, in German, you say Fegefeuer, uh, you know, cleansing, uh, cleansing uh, fire, and so on. And then the transition between three and four is typically experienced as death and rebirth. Suddenly, you have the feeling that uh, you hit bottom, um, that your life was a, an error, you, you have been a failure, Everything that you ever believe uh, was not right, was not uh, true. Everything that you have done was wrong. Uh, you know, a sense of, of, of total uh, capitulation and total defeat, and then from there opening into light, into white light, um, golden light. You can see archetypal images of deities. Uh, at the time when, when you would be encountering your mother now in a new form, before you were part of her, now you are encounter her as a, as a separate being, you can also have the experience of encountering great mother goddess from another culture, including cultures, again, that you don't know anything about. You would be in the, in the collective unconscious. Okay, so this is the... This is the, the verbal part, and now we will go to the, to the images. Hmm. I don't know what's happening, it doesn't... Ne neither... Hmm? What did you, at the, now I can continue with this one, yeah? okay. or this, okay. You can do it, whatever, see. Okay. Uh, it was just because there was a long pause? No? Okay. Okay, so um, what we will see first is a series of wonderful drawings of a professional uh, artist, uh, Harriet Francis. Um, she, she volunteered uh, for a um, psychedelic session, she got a high dose of uh, LSD in um, the context of a program, uh, which an, an official, you know, legal uh, program 
which was conducted in the 60s in uh, Menlo Park. And her whole experience was on the perinatal level, which is, uh, I remind you, a level that current psychiatry does not recognize, okay? So they don't recognize the perinatal and the transpersonal level. This is an addition from, from consciousness research. Now, her experience was basically on the perinatal level with some opening into the transpersonal level, and she had this amazing capacity to actually, after the session, to be able to uh, draw from memory what, what happened to her. This exists, I don't know if uh, uh, Vladimir has a plan, any plans, this exists as a, as a book. Uh, I worked with her quite a bit. I wasn't, I wasn't running her session in Menlo Park. This was before I came to the United States. But I worked with her quite a bit because uh, she asked me to write a foreword to her book. So this exists now in the form of a book, not just the pictures that you will see, but later she continued with a Jungian therapist and had some fantastic experiences with past lives and so on. Um, she had uh, uh, ancestry from uh, Crete, from the island Crete, and her past life experiences took her to the Minoan culture, uh, you know, with the cult of, uh, of uh, uh, the, uh, the bull, uh, so that, that all that is uh, contained in that book, which is called Drawing It Out. Now, I'll first uh, show a kind of a synoptic view of her paintings so that you can get a sense of the unfolding of the, of the process. And then I will take one picture after another and tell you something about it. Okay, so this is the first picture. What you see is uh, the upper part of this picture, uh, geometrical ornaments. This was something very typical, uh, in, uh, particularly in the beginning, where people were using lower, uh, lower dosages, or something that happened at the beginning of a high-dose uh, psychedelic session. If this were uh, paintings rather than drawings, this would be in very rich colors. So people were talking about seeing uh, kaleidoscopic displays, seeing images that were like uh, stained glass uh, windows in Gothic cathedrals, uh, images that were like arabesques, like the decorations in Muslim uh, um, mosques or, or in Alhambra or something like that. Uh, now, those of us who had these experiences, when we saw fractals, does everybody know what fractals are? The fractals are um, computer-generated uh, images based on a category of equations which are called nonlinear. So it's a graphic representation of these nonlinear equations, and you basically get a very colorful geometrical ornaments, and if you go to lower magnifications or higher magnifications, the, the pattern returns, but with variations. And you can buy it these, these days. You can, you can buy uh, something that's called the Mandelbrot set or the Julian set, and if you play it, it's just like being in a psychedelic session. You can see this unfolding of these beautiful ornaments. So when we saw these fractals, we said, you know, this is what was happening to us. We saw fractals. Now, fractals are related to the theory of chaos. And so we would see these fractals when our ordinary uh, organization of reality is disintegrating but before we actually uh, take the journey into our deep unconscious. So it's a kind of a um, frontier phenomenon in the, in the psychedelic journey. 
Now here, what you can see, she's getting into the next phase where it's getting heavier. She now feels oppressed, pressure on her chest, and she has this uh, kind of anxious uh, expectation, anxious anticipation. Now this is now a situation where the, what we would call the Cartesian Newtonian reality with Fritjof Capra is kind of disintegrating, is falling apart. And uh, as you can see, she doesn't like it. She's scared and she is trying to stop it. Of course, there is no good way to stop a psychedelic experience once it's, ha once it's happening. The very bad way of stopping it is what's currently done routinely by uh, mainstream psychiatrists, which is put people on a, a big dose of tranquilizers and as a result of it is basically freezes uh, the, the process in a bad place and people can stay for a very long time and they get uh, maintenance dosages and it, the process never resolves itself. So the, the correct way of, of dealing with people who had a bad trip is to just reassure them, say you have taken a substance, this is just a matter of time, everything's fine, everything's gonna be fine, you hold their hand and you just uh, play for time. And because this means that the person is facing a very difficult aspect of their unconscious, a properly resolved bad trip uh, means a major healing, major, major transformation of the, of the person. So she recognized that there was no way she could, she could stop it and she is now surrendering as you can see. And the next picture is what I described. Now she's being pulled into this whirlpool, into this mile stream. And we can see a mandala there made of skulls and uh, rib cages. The other interesting thing that you see is she uh, lost her clothes. She is naked. Many people who reach this level, which is about birth and death, feel that it's very inappropriate to, to be dressed uh, in that situation. Um, most people have just the feeling that it's inappropriate. Um, you know, sometimes people actually take off their, uh, take off their clothes in that, uh, in that situation. And now she is in the underworld, in the realm of death. You can see the, the bones, the symbols of death. She's also suffering now. It's almost like being on a, you know, impaled on a rack. And um, we'll talk later about the spider as a, as a typical symbol, uh, perinatal symbol actually describing the devouring uh, feminine. Carl Gustav Jung in his book, uh, it's uh, Symbols of Transformation, when he departed from Freud, he actually is writing about it, that he found through comparative study of mythology that the spider is a, a symbol of the, of the devouring feminine. There is, uh, this, is, this focuses on the, on the uh, one aspect of uh, the spider, which is catching uh, organisms that have freedom, the butterflies, the, the flies, and uh, constricting them, depriving them of their freedom, the way the, the contractions deprive the fetus of the, of the freedom of the womb and is threatening uh, the life of these creatures. Now the spider also has another aspect, which is it creates a beautiful spider web. So in mythology, you find also the spider in this other function. In uh, Native American uh, Indian tradition, uh, you have the figure of uh, the spider woman who is the cosmic weaver. She's we weaving the, the web of existence, the fabric of uh, existence. Now this was a very kind of a miserable, you know, pitiful specimen. 
you will see much, much more respectable spiders later. Another you know, powerful element which makes a lot of sense in relation to birth, feeling crushed, feeling extreme uh, pressure. She now is experiencing herself as being uh, under this gigantic boulder, and the boulder, uh, when I talked with her initially, had the, the face of her husband, and it became like a symbol of her oppressive marriage. And then later she started feeling that it represented more uh, uh, the kind of um, oppression that she experienced from her mother in her childhood until finally she experienced that there was, was a situation where the mother was literally crushing her which was a, when she was being born in the, in the birth canal. And it's, if you think about it, it's a very beautiful representation of birth because birth is something that comes from a human being, from the mother, but it's very mechanical, like the, you know, like the crushing boulder. Later we'll see, particularly in Giger, uh, a, a similar way of dealing with it, where you will see a combination of anatomy and machine. I worked with a, with a patient who, after an experience of going through birth, uh, to, uh, told me, uh, I have been through, the, through a meat grinder today, to grind meat. And uh, another patient during the session had identification with uh, Charlie Chaplin in the movie Modern Times, if any of you remember it, where he got caught in this big machine and it's kind of processed through the, through the machine. So the combination of the mechanical and the biological. Again, you know, these are amazingly illustrative uh, kind of uh, images that you, where you can learn a lot about the process. When you are experiencing birth, you are in the process of being given li uh, life coming into the world, but also having your life threatened in different degrees depending how difficult the birth is. So there is birth and death together. In our unconscious, they are recorded in uh, such an intimate entanglement. In our left brain, uh, for our intellect, birth and death are very different. You know, birth is at the beginning of life, death happens to sick people or at the end of life. This is not true for our unconscious. For our unconscious, being born and dying uh, um, is, is a package, it comes together. So here you can see in the lower part, it's clearly death. The skulls, the, uh, the rib cages, the, the, the bones. Uh, but in, and she's reduced to a skeleton at the bottom, but the upper part is very clearly uh, like birth. She's trying to get out of there while she is simultaneously dying. Her life is being threatened and she is fighting to be, to be born. Again, another very, very illustrative picture. When our process of regression in these holotropic states reaches the perinatal level, reaches the, the level of birth and death, the experiences become spiritual. Uh, Carl Gustav Jung would say the, the experiences become numinous. They have, they, just, they have the quality of sacredness, which is a kind of a di direct experiential quality of of that. So uh, what happens uh, is that uh, sources of, of inner intrinsic mystical feelings emerge and we discover spirituality. I have worked with many people in Prague, you know, we worked in a, a research institute so we had a lot of uh, communist uh, party members, Marxists, people who were giving lectures ag against religion as, as the opium of uh, masses. We had s positivistic scientists who were very materialistic, uh, you know, atheistic, skeptical, and they came for emotional psychosomatic problems. But when their process reached this level, they all opened to 
spirituality. They recognize that you know, spirituality uh, is not some kind of a, uh, uh, superstition or, or um, uh, sort of fantasy, that this is a legitimate, uh, vital dimension of the psyche and of the universal. So people, people discover, experientially discover uh, the, the mystical perspective, they discover spirituality. And this is beautifully uh, represented on this picture where you can see that the, what you previously saw as symbols of death, the bones, are now being arranged into basically spiritual symbols. There's something like an altar, there's something like a crucifix, and above you have kind of rune-like spiritual symbols, and she is sitting there in deep uh, uh, immersion, kind of meditating on these uh, symbols. Uh, another very, very interesting uh, picture that, that teaches us about another aspect of the perinatal experience, which is that these experiences are a combination of uh, surgical, obstetric elements and mythological, archetypal elements. This is a memory of a manual help that she got from the obstetrician uh, when she was coming out of the birth canal, but as she is reliving it, it becomes a scene, a mythological scene, where a demigod is rescuing her from the underworld, from the, from the realm of uh, death. This is a very shamanic sequence. I talked about the death rebirth of shamans yesterday. Uh, I mentioned that I worked with her. Uh, she didn't know anything about shamanism when she had this experience. She had no uh, idea who Jung was. All this that you see just emerged out of her uh, unconscious, spontaneously. It doesn't come from any kind of uh, reading, you know, or anything that she knew intellectually. This is the experience uh, where uh, we would talk about the ego death. This would be the experience when the, the shaman, during the shamanic initiation, experiences uh, annihilation, dismemberment, and so on. And then the, the turn and the beginning, we talked about the magical flight or the magical journey of the, of the shaman into the uh, celestial realms, into the solar uh, realm. Here, again, something interesting. Uh, there's a stylized identification uh, with crucifixion. Uh, and of course, this, our, our cultural um, image of this, or symbol for this process of death and rebirth, death and resurrection, is the story of, of the suffering and death and rebirth of, of Jesus. But the interesting thing is that uh, you can be from a culture that is Christian, but when you reach this point, uh, you can identify with some other mythological figure, uh, which could be Dionysus, which could be Attis, which could be Adonis, which could be uh, Quetzalcoatl, and so on. And uh, then you experience the, the death and rebirth in identification with that particular, uh, with that particular deity. The experience of identification with Jesus at this point is very, very common. We had one session uh, where there were 36 people, which means 18 of them breathing. Uh, you breathe with your eyes closed. You don't know what's happening in the room. And six out of the 18 uh, ended up on the cross in a full identification uh, with Jesus. You know that medieval monks were asked to uh, uh, identify with Jesus. This was called imitatio uh, Christi, uh, identifying with uh, Jesus and his uh, suffering. And these kinds of states generate that experience uh, spontaneously in people. Uh, spontaneously, here it is in use, of course, pharmacologically. Uh, it could be induced by the breathwork but it can happen to people as part of spiritual emergency. It's a very common phenomenon in psychiatric hospitals. The people 
have this full identification with Jesus and they believe that they are the second coming. There was a book written about a, a department in Ypsilanti in the United States where they had three patients, uh, all of whom believed they were Jesus. And they actually brought them together and, you know, let them uh, work it out between, uh, between them. So uh, people don't realize when they have that full identification with Jesus that this is something that anybody can have in an ordinary state and they can see it in terms of their own uniqueness that they are actually the second that they are the second coming and then you know they start calling the the president uh, or uh, you know try to make it public and of course end up in uh, in a psychiatric hospital um, now in general you can you can have the experience of um, one's own divinity the way uh, the Eastern spiritual philosophies talk about it. And um, the important thing is not to get inflated because as long as you have that experience of one's own divinity and you don't surrender the, the ego, uh, it becomes a delusional kind of a situation where you believe you are divine but nobody else is divine. You are, you're special, you deserve some kind of a you know, special treatment for that. If that process is allowed to complete itself, you realize that you experience your own divinity, but uh, everybody else has the same potential. And there are actually some people around you who already had the experience, and if they properly integrated it, uh, they wouldn't talk with you because they would know that you, you, you cannot understand it. So this is a very, very common, at this point, a very common experience to somehow either see these images of uh, these archetypal figures representing death and rebirth or actually become them, identify uh, with them. And here is a symbolic uh, representation of the fact that now the inner, uh, you know, quote unquote, operation is finished. When you get stitches, things are kind of closing again. And here she is emerging from the birth canal with a vision of a peacock. A peacock, cross-culturally, is a symbol of rebirth, uh, resurrection. Uh, it is a symbol of the star-spangled uh, sky, a symbol of immortality. Also, I mentioned at this point, you would encounter your own mother or a great mother goddess. Many of the great mother goddesses have a peacock as their personal symbol. Juno, Hera, uh, Saraswati, and so on. Uh, the uh, peacock is also a powerful symbol in alchemy, uh, where it is called cauda pavonis, the peacock tail, a powerful symbol of transfiguration. The Lamaistic deities are frequently represented as sitting on uh, peacocks, and we see any number of peacock elements in the mandalas that people draw in in uh, psychedelic sessions. So, so coming out of the birth canal from the third to the fourth matrix, frequently you see peacock designs, rainbow is another powerful symbol there, or, or um, images of, of deities in, in the light. And here something fascinating happens. Now she was born, she emer emerged from the birth canal, and suddenly the regression became open. She, she somehow, by experiencing all the pain and all the struggle of the birth canal, she suddenly has the way open to regress all the way into the prenatal state. So from the fourth matrix, she now goes to the, to the first matrix, into the oceanic aspect of it, and she's now identifying with different uh, aquatic uh, uh, animals. So the fetal state, the oceanic state, and the cosmic state are astrologically are Neptunian states, and they're all very closely related. It can go from one to another. And here she's coming down. The emphasis is now on being firmly connected to the Earth, but the head is in heavens. And you can see birds as, again, uh, cross-cultural symbols of uh, 
of um, spiritual liberation. So this was the journey of one person. Now we will see a number of pictures of different people as they experience the, the matrices and we'll follow the order of um, the, uh, the, act, the actual stages of biological birth. First matrix, second, third. In uh, your inner process, you would not experience it necessarily uh, in a linear way. You can experience uh, just one or another matrix. Uh, uh, you can experience different combinations of the matrices. And of course, uh, you would have to do it more than, more than once. The, if you imagine that you, the birth star, uh, lasted many hours, you cannot expect that you will resolve it all in one, uh, one afternoon. So now here is the experience of being in a good womb that is also opening into the experience of being in the cosmos. And here we can see something interesting. In uh, uh, these holotropic states, you can experience more than one level sometimes simultaneously, sometimes going from one to the other. So this experience actually goes from being in the good womb to being on a good breast. They're both symbiotic situations, fusion with the mother, and in both situations, the connection is through a liquid, through the blood uh, in the intrauterine situation and through the milk during uh, nursing. So you can see that the, the galaxy has the shape of a, of a breast. And we have it in language. Uh, gala in Greek is uh, milk, and in luck in, in uh, uh, Latin is milk. And um, a galaxy is the milky, milky way. We have it in, uh, in uh, somehow it got into language. This is another. Uh, uh, client experiencing the same situation, only the fetus so is relatively smaller in uh, relation to the rest of the, uh, the galaxy. This is the other possibility where the good intrauterine situation opens into a, an oceanic situation. And this picture has, has it all. It is a fetus in uh, an aquatic environment, oceanic environment, with these different uh, uh, aquatic life forms, the dolphins and so on. And at the same time, it's like an orbiting satellite. So the, the fetal, the oceanic, and the cosmic uh, all comes together. This is the identification uh, with the fetus in a good womb and simultaneous uh, experience of identification with what Carl Gustav Jung would call the divine child archetype. Uh, an example would be uh, Jesus. Jesus was a baby, but he was the, you know, he was a, a divine child. Um, another possibility that we'll see later is um, the, the newborn can be identified as what's called a child king or child queen uh, uh, archetype. Jesus was a baby, but he was the king of the world. Uh, Krishna is sometimes represented as a baby playing with a butter ball, and the butter ball represents the whole, whole world. So this really magic baby with you know, incredible uh, power. This was uh, in Prague. Uh, it might not be easy to figure out. In the middle of this light, on the left side is the, is the patient. You can see her legs at the bottom, and then kind of vaguely two eyes in the left upper corner. Can you see that? And then uh, there's an outline of a figure on the right side, which is myself, in case you didn't recognize me. She had the experience of being in a good womb. And then she opened her eyes, and she looked at me, and she felt that there were no boundaries between us. And actually, uh, in the same way in which there are no boundaries between uh, the, you know, the fetus and the mother. And in that context, she told me, uh, 
uh, I can read your mind. I know what you're thinking. And so the scientist in me said, okay, well, let's try. What am I thinking? And I found out that she knew exactly what I was thinking. So it was not just something that was in her head, the idea that the boundaries dis disappeared, but she was able to practically prove that, that at that point, you know, the, the boundaries disappeared. Now, this is the opposite now. This is a, this is a bad womb. This is a, or a, at least a wave of toxicity, which can, you know, depend, depends on what the mother is doing. You know, could be smoking, could be uh, drinking, and so on. Uh, the, f the f sense of being poisoned, uh, but at the same time, uh, experience it, experiencing it as if it were coming from some kind of in insidious demonic entities, like a, like a demonic kitchen or, or chemical laboratory. Uh, this is very, very interesting because this is a situation that on our level we would interpret chemically. This is, there's a toxicity in the womb. Uh, what you see in the, in, uh, the non-ordinary state is that there is a higher level of forces that are causing it. The archetypal forces that are responsible for it are expressing itself chemically, but they have uh, uh, identity of, uh, of their own. And simultaneously, there is this sense of uh, tremendous connection and uh, identity with creatures that are in a similar situation, in a similar predicament. That means fish in polluted rivers and a chicken embryo in a very advanced stage of embryogenesis when, where there is a lot of toxicity inside of the egg because you know, there's an explosive growth uh, of the fetus, of the, of the embryo, and uh, the metabolic toxic products don't have anywhere to go. So there's a lot of toxicity before uh, hatching. Uh, I talked before about the RH incompatibility. This would be the, the experience of an aggressive, uh, not, a, not a poisonous, but an ag aggressive uh, womb. And again, uh, you can see uh, from, a, from my medical perspective, it, this would be a, a chemical, biochemical uh, situation, immunological incompatibility. Uh, but when it's experienced in an ordinary state, again, there is a, a sense of a, an archetypal level of, of forces, of entities that are actually causing it, causing that particular uh, state. So like there's a, there's a whole other invisible dimension that then forms and informs what is happening here. This is also the basic Freud, uh, the, the basic uh, Jungian idea, uh, which is also a very Platonic idea, the idea of forms with capital F, ideas that are then shaping what is happening, uh, what is happening here. Uh, this is a really bad womb, as you can see. And this uh, um, client called this experience always hungry. Actually, experience of, of uh, in, in, uh, ad adequate uh, uh, nutrition, nourishment in, the, in uh, the womb. And uh, I really uh, like this picture. This was uh, experiencing oneself as a fetus, but there was not enough vitality, not enough vital energy. And the way this was rep represented is, you can see the fetus is like inside of an electric bulb, but if you take a close look, uh, the, uh, the bulb is disconnected from the electric current. It's a bulb that does not get any, any energy. It's a quite, quite a remarkable uh, drawing or painting. Um, this actually is a continuation of, or, or the same, same uh, person that painted the always hungry. And it was like always hungry in the womb, but also uh, starved and, uh, you know, as you can see, almost dying uh, on the breast. Bad womb and bad 
breast before we saw good womb and good, good breast. Now this is now the first picture of uh, Hans Rudi Giger. Uh, I showed his whole series of uh, paintings uh, the other night for the, uh, for the artistic uh, uh, gathering. Uh, he is the one who got the uh, Academy Award for the movie uh, The Alien. And uh, he got stuck in uh, uh, those uh, you know, negative uh, perinatal matrices. But he has this amazing, amazing capacity of um, bringing the images back, very much like Harriet Francis did in her drawings. Um, that evening, I also mentioned uh, Jean-Paul Sartre, who had an unresolved mescaline session of the second matrix, and then uh, how it influenced his own writing, uh, including the play No Exit that he, that he wrote. So this is uh, Hans Rudi Giger, who is the absolute master of portraying this realm in, uh, in the unconscious that is the, a very common source of bad trips. You see, when people hit this in a psychedelic session, that's possibly the worst experience you can, uh, you can have when you, because it seems on the deepest level like being in hell. Extremely unpleasant, emotional, physical situation, very much like what the fetus feels in, in the, uh, this stage of the, uh, of the delivery. So he called this the, the uterine landscape when he had the experience of now getting experientially in touch with the inside of the uterus. So, uh, you know, the uterus represents sex, certainly, and also represents birth. Now, you can see what he did in the next picture. He, he added these black crosses, which of course we associate with death. It's like a like a cemetery. So we have now birth, sex, and death. Now when I showed this in Switzerland, uh, and there were men in the audience who said, well, this shape uh, of, the, of these crosses, this is the shape of the targets that the Swiss army uses for shooting practice. So he somehow got there in this very subtle, symbolic way, also the element of aggression birth, sex, death, and aggression. Very interesting way of working with uh, symbols. Um, by the way, uh, it's very, very powerful uh, art uh, that a lot of people can respond negatively. And he is very, very frequently uh, attacked as being, you know, from a pervert to a Satanist and so on. Um, um, I mentioned that I have been writing a book about him and I wrote a preface to his last book where I'm trying to show that he is a realist. He's, he represents a very realistic way the imagery from a dark uh, side of, of human nature that current psychiatry is not recognizing, is not aware of. But on the other hand, as we will see later, this is, the, this is the realm of the psyche that helps us understand phenomena like, like Nazism, like uh, communism, like genocide, like uh, what's happening in concentration camps, uh, you know, what's happening in, in Iraq and so on. If we had just uh, a psyche where the only problems that we carry is uh, uh, nursing uh, problems or spanking, uh, we would not see phenomena uh, like we see in, in, in our world. I mean, it has to, has to be coming from, from an area that is of equal relevance. So if these forces from the unconscious somehow uh, get unleashed, uh, and this is hap what happens in, in wars, where suddenly it's not only permission given, but order given to people to act this out. You see, people are drafted uh, as soldiers and they have to uh, go and then these kinds of forces get, get uh, out of hand. 
So it's extremely important for us really to learn what, what are we dealing with, where, where these forces are coming from, and is there anything that we can do about them? Uh, uh, you know, actually, if we want the human species to survive, we have now uh, weapons of mass destruction that, uh, you know, is not on the same level as, as when the Neanderthals were uh, fighting with uh, clubs. I mean, today we have means we can we can destroy. Uh, the human species, and we can take you know a few other species along. So it's it's really imperative somehow to to recognize this. We cannot be closing our eyes and denying uh, that this is uh, uh, something that is part of uh, human nature. Now, in in under ordinary circumstances, particularly if people experience good childhood, uh, this is covered. This uh, there is a there is a buffering zone, you know, that uh, this might not really manifest in the life of people. They might not recognize it un until and unless they do some powerful inner, inner work. But in some other people, particularly those who have difficult births and then difficult childhood, this whole realm becomes much more available and it then manifests in nightmares or then it surfaces in the form of different forms of uh, uh, psychopathology. Uh, so, um, what I'm trying to, to show is that, uh, um, you know, he is a realist. He, he describes uh, a domain that actually exists in the, in the human psyche. It's not, you know, something that's, that's uh, specific for, uh, for him. Now this is, uh, you know, the Carmen and, uh, and uh, he with the mask that he created. I think we saw this, yeah, a bit before. Okay, now this is um, uh, another version of the whirlpool that we already saw. Uh, the other night I talked about um, Edgar Allan Poe, how many of his powerful stories can be understood as perinatal stories. He has one story that's actually called A Descent into the Milestream. Brothers, uh, Norwegian fishermen are caught and they experience this diabolic kind of descent into the, the Milestream and then finally one of them survives it and has, is going through a really powerful death rebirth experience. Now this is very, very interesting. We, uh, we have a situation in birth where the, where the fetus is attacked by the contractions of the uterus, but also responds with tremendous fury. There's an enormous amount of aggression is generated as a response. Um, and we could <laughs> make an experiment, we could take a, a volunteer from this group and take that person to a swimming pool and hold the head underwater for a minute and you would see murderous aggression uh, generated. Now the child spends hours in a situation where it's very uncomfortable, which generates a lot of response and there is no way it can be expressed. And the little crying that happens after birth is uh, negligible as compared to what would be necessary to really psychologically process this. So we, we are processing these emotions, let's say, in the breath work, in psychedelic sessions, or it's happening in people in spiritual emergency when these things start, start surfacing. So here you can see that she's being attacked, but she's also becoming evil uh, because she's now responding with fury to what is happening to her. This is another Giger. You can see the uh, focus here on the uh, frailty of the fetuses, but also the brutality of the experience. You can see grenades, submachine guns, and then also these uh, steel bands which are contracting, uh, compressing the forehead. This is his self-portrait. You can see that, you know, he is basically uh, describing his own inner experience. 
very interesting picture he called the, st the stillbirth machine showing the mother and the child caught in this situation of the second matrix where uh, they both suffer and they're, it's, they're sort of caught like in this uh, torturing machine. They're, they're caught in a situation where the mother is hurting the child, the child is hurting the mother, and they have no way of escaping the situation. Uh, it's, a, it's a situation of deep antagonism between the mother and the child. I worked with people who had difficult relationship with their mother, and they were able ultimately to trace it to uh, the situation, and it became very liberating because they realized that, that part of the negative feelings they have about uh, their mothers is not uh, a response to some situation where the mother had a choice to, to uh, act in a particular way, but this is a side product of a life-giving process. The mother, if she wants to give life to the child, uh, you know, is going to hurt the child. This is, this is something that's built into the natural uh, order. And, you know, certainly caesarean sections don't solve the problems. They, they produce, you know, a lot of other problems. So, so we, we see some of the, some more of these experiences. A snake is a common perinatal symbol. The, the viper as the uh, kind of the symbol of imminent death and the boa constrictor is a very powerful perinatal symbol. When they swallow the prey, they look pregnant. They also twist the body around the prey and they crush. So you know, not every snake is a penis the way, uh, the way Freud saw it. There are other symbolic meanings. And then on the, on the archetypal level, there are as many meanings of snakes as there are archetypal systems. Uh, the snake in the Garden of Eden is very different from the snake representing Kundalini or the snake Muchalinda who was protecting uh, uh, the Buddha or the rainbow serpent of the uh, Australian ab Aborigines or Quetzalcoatl, the plumed serpent that we saw yesterday. So on the archetypal level, snakes can have many different uh, meanings. Now here is a little more respectable spider. I talk about spider as in this function as a symbol of uh, a uh, force that deprives us of that sense of spatial freedom that we have in the, in the womb. Like a, a fly or a butterfly, you know, has the whole world, or whole world belongs to them until they fl fly into a spider web. People who have arachnophobia, they uh, typically see the, what the spider is doing to the, to the fly and then that stirs up their own memory because they realize they experience something, something similar, losing that freedom, being uh, constrained and so on. And this becomes more and more respectable. This is from Eidos LSD session. This is from our holotropic breathwork training. This is also uh, the holotropic breathwork training. Uh, pay special attention to this one because we will see, in a while we'll see uh, the resolution of this. This is again Heido's LSD session. And this, these two pictures are not uh, from inner self-exploration. At some point, I became interested in the art that people uh, draw or paint uh, when they are on death row. There's, on the internet, there's a whole thing about uh, art of people who know that they will die soon. So this is a person expecting execution. And the, the bars are very obvious. The person is in prison, but suddenly there is a spider web, you know, a typical symbol of the second matrix. And here it becomes even more specific. I mean, what does, I mean, in the, in the logical sense, what does a spider have to do with impending uh, execution? So that situation now activates the second matrix in the, in the person. This is the 
delivering womb that's uh, experienced as a combination of a prison, of a gigantic press, and a, a torture chamber. And this is Giger's uh, representation of what, what uh, Freud would call vagina dentata, the vagina that can kill, that can castrate only in uh, uh, holotropic work, we realize this is not a, some silly fantasy of, a, of an infant, of a child, that Freud had in mind, but this is related to the memory of what that organ did to us in one particular situation, namely when it was delivering us. But then it's extrapolated to other situations where it doesn't apply. Uh, uh, the contractions represented as an octopus. The, the termination of the oceanic aspect of the freedom of the first matrix. You can see the python that I already mentioned as a symbol. The, the birth experience represented as a fight with a python. Here the insight that that the, uh, the perinatal experience is a source of profound irrational guilt, people who suffer from guilt, uh, because when you realize how much pain was inflicted on you, uh, something within you would interpret it as punishment. Something this horrible would not have happened to us unless uh, we uh, were bad, we were somehow essentially bad so that we deserve that. So a lot of people discover a source of their otherwise irrational guilt in uh, birth and they free themselves from guilt as they are bringing the pain into consciousness and processing it. We have it in Christian mythology. The, the primal sin is related to expulsion from a, uh, from a paradisian situation, from, from uh, paradise and uh, it's even uh, in the Bible, it's explicitly linked to uh, labor pain because God tells Eve now, in pain and sorrow shalt thou bring forth uh, children. Now we're moving to the third matrix. You can see the contractions are still attacking. They are represented as, as um, um, predatory birds, but there is already a chance, however meager for the for the fetus to get out. More Giger. Now we have the combination of sex and aggression and death. You can see the, the helmet, the, the skulls, the fangs, and the, the, you know, the sexual symbols. Again, the boa constrictor snakes, we feel at, attacked. There is certainly a demonic element. And uh, experience of crushing and something that we would see as blasphemy. I mean, suddenly, suddenly uh, the spiritual element is surfacing, but still in the context of that, of that old, very negative things. This is, by the way, we are reaching the, uh, uh, somehow the frontier of the spiritual and the, the, uh, the negative uh, perinatal matrices, which creates uh, uh, images of blasphemy the sacred and the, and the, you know, the disgusting, the, the dark, the aggressive is kind of mixed. Very, very similar, only the sexual element is more, more expressed here. This is his uh, now Im image of a kind of Kali figure. At this point, we would be uh, in, archetypically in connection with the devouring feminine. We start from the mother nature when the, when the feminine is the life-giving and the nourishing element, then it becomes frightening, uh, kind of uh, uh, devouring uh, element, and then towards the end when we are born again, uh, the feminine returns to the nurturing uh, role. We, we can see again the the combination of the, the sexual, the aggressive, the demonic, and you can see that he is aware of the connection to birth because you can see 
in the middle, at the bottom, you can see the head in a, in a vise being compressed. And again, the combination of the, of the mechanical and the biological. And, uh, you know, some of the people who are, for example, reliving difficult births, and particularly in high dose psychedelic sessions, can now encounter demonic uh, archetypes. So this is uh, his representation of a figure um, actually known from uh, Eliphaz Levi as Baphomet, kind of a demonic figure. And again, you can see that he connects it with, the, with birth, uh, with the perinatal. At the bottom, you can see the skulls. You can see the two fetuses with the grenades that before had these uh, constricting belts on their head and you can see above the boa constrictor element. This is what uh, an actual scene of Sabbath of the witches would uh, look like. Sometimes these kinds of images can appear at this point. And this is from, from uh, psychedelic sessions. And suddenly in people who might have no idea, no intellectual knowledge of what Walpurgis Night was, what the, uh, what the um, uh, Sabbath of the witches was. Suddenly they experienced the, uh, you know, the president of the Sabbath, which was the devil in the form of, the, of uh, a billy goat, and it's the, all the rituals that were happening around the uh, the flight, uh, the, the, the various uh, vehicles that are used. And there is a blasphemous scene of uh, little children playing with toads in holy water and dressing toads as, uh, as uh, you know, cardinals and so on. So the, the, the known scenes from the Sabbath of the witches, this is an archetype again that can, that can uh, appear in uh, the mind of uh, um, people who are in non-ordinary state spontaneously or induced by some ways. This is a modern painting by Clovy Trouy, uh, who is a French painter. He has all these, again, these, these satanic uh, elements. So you can see uh, a tombstone with a vaginal opening, sex, death, a naked woman on a tombstone, again, sex, death naked woman in a coffin playing with her breast, uh, violent images, severed head, uh, a whip, and so on, and blasphemy, these naked nuns, and uh, the monstrance, you know, planted into a very scatological uh, medium. This is uh, the last moment of birth, when the head is actually coming out, and it is experienced as the ego death coming from this image of Mahakali. Kali, not the, not the one that's uh, one of the figures in the pe Hindu pantheon, but the, the uh, Kali from the tantric tradition, where you have basically two players. You have Shiva and Shakti, you know, Maha, Maha Shakti, Kali. She is... Uh, you know, the, uh, the creatress of the, of the world. Um, and this is, uh, this, their power is, re uh, is represented here, that she is like a shashlik uh, um, turtle and nine elephants, which in, the Hindu, in Hindu mythology are the support of the, of the cosmos. So she is the boss, you see, she is the, the force. Now, in the right, right upper uh, corner is the, is the person who is having the experience surrendering to the, to the power of the feminine. And uh, you can see the head of the child, uh, which is the co content of the experience of that person, is the head of the child is coming uh, out of the vagina. And this coincides also now with the experience of tasting the blood of the uh, of, of the bleeding vagina of the, of the mother. This is, uh, uh, the original is really Hokusai, is a classical uh, Japanese uh, painter, was brought by one of my uh, clients, was turned into a, for a slideshow, was turned into a, 
this is a, a, a color painting, this is a, a woodcut. You can see a different kind of octopus, an octopus that is not threatening life like in the second matrix. This is more like a bondage situation, like a sexual, sensual situation when there is confinement, but also sexual feelings. Um, and this shows the, um, the very interesting picture, shows the connection between uh, um, um, the Freud's castration complex, which he relates to the penis, and uh, the deeper level of that problem, which is related to cutting of the umbilical cord. Uh, I don't have time to, to talk about this very, very fascinating thing, how you can understand both of those Freudian basic concepts of vagina dentata and castration complex in a very new way if you relate it to birth rather than, rather than to uh, loss of the penis or, or the um, a fantasy of the child about the female genitals. This is uh, um, about close, as close as Giger came to transcendence at this point. This was, uh, for, uh, again, for the dune. This was the staircase to the uh, Harkonnen castle in the, in the movie. So the, uh, but here it's like the road to heaven, but you can see that there is a danger of being hurt, being killed. And again, the interesting uh, combination of uh, the sexual and the death-related, these uh, formations that are phallic, but they're also bones. They're related to sex and death at the same time. We talk about the snake, snake pit. Here is uh, still the entanglement with the snake, but now the possibility of getting out, getting through. And here is a real breakthrough where the snake represents the old elements of the personality, but suddenly a whole new uh, realm is emerging that is represented as a, as a growing embryo and as a sprouting seed. And this is another experience of the moment of birth where the lower part was described by the patient as the swamp or the quagmire of my unconscious. And the upper part is the breakthrough now, is the, is the, the birth, is the opening into the cosmic. And, this, uh, and there's an interface where the dangerous animals are becoming kind of friendly animals this kind of a dolphin-like creature. And she is now here, what I described before, as a child queen. Uh, she represents herself with a little crown. And uh, talking about language, it is interesting that, and I, I don't remember how it is in Russian, but uh, in uh, the American and British obstetricians talk about crowning when the when the head is coming out. And there seems to be a deep connection between coronation um, of, of kings and queens and this experience of, of crowning, which is the, you know, connecting to the archetypal level. And the, uh, the royalty is somehow, and as well as, as clergy, uh, is um, claiming the connection to the divine by using gold and jewels and so on, which are symbols of the transcendental uh, realm. We saw before being swallowed as the beginning of the process, here being regorged into a kind of a carnival scene. Uh, carnivals are very interesting because they f focus a lot on death. People are um, wearing sort of uh, uh, T-shirts, you know, with skeletons, and they use uh, uh, puppets of skeletons, the same as the uh, All Saints Day in, in Mexico. Um, so there's a lot of images of death, but it's not about dying. It's not frightening. It's a kind of a celebration. Uh, so these are images that people get 
when uh, they emerged from a situation where they felt uh, they might lose their life. They had profound encounter with death, which was scary. Here they are still kind of in touch with that realm of death, but they already know they've made it, you know. The, and there's also the release of energies. Uh, so, and then it creates these images of, uh, of carnival, as if in carnivals we somehow touch, you see, in our unconscious to that moment where we were almost, almost born, not quite. Here, um, this last stage of birth represented as climbing a mountain towards life, and still the attacks of the contraction, uh, contractions represented as the attacks of birds, predatory birds. I talked about fire as being the last uh, experience, the purging, purgatorial fire. Just around the ego death, we can have the feeling. This was the last moment before being born. This patient said, uh, if we imagine that this hall is the birth canal, she is kind of in a horizontal, perpendicular position. Uh, the triangle that you see in the middle is the vortex where the head is breaking through. And then you can see these bright colors, the, the yellows, the oranges, the reds. Uh, this was her representation of the explosive energy that goes into that last moment. People have the feeling that if they continue uh, their head isn't going to explode. Uh, you know, the whole world is going to uh, explode. I worked with people who at this point had the feeling that somebody pushed the button and uh, atomic war started and the energy which was before confined is now sort of, uh, you know, uh, going what we say, what we call haywire, going wild, you see. Uh, Another, uh, uh, a little more friendly symbol that can appear in this is the genie uh, who was confined in the bottle. You see this horrendous uh, force and then sort of is released from the, and also is now offering all kinds of gifts. Another symbol that, that uh, belongs here, archetypal symbol, is the symbol of the uh, horn of plenty, cornu cornucopia, see where you, you kind of uh, are going through this kind of triangular situation, you, you, you come out and suddenly there are uh, lots of gifts. The gifts that you get here are not uh, anything material, but it's, uh, it's the enrichment of your experience of the world. What uh, William Blake and uh, after him Huxley called cleansing the doors of perception. Suddenly, uh, the world looks more beautiful, uh, food tastes better, uh, lovemaking is great, uh, you hear music like you never heard before, so that you get a cornucopia, but the cornucopia is, is experiential uh, cornucopia, not material cornucopia. Uh, now, we are at, in the realm of the ego, death, and rebirth. Uh, we saw before one destructive deity appearing, which was the Kali, the Mahakali. This is another version. There could be different deities from different cultures that appear at this point. This is Moloch. Moloch was described in the Bible as a deity that was worshipped in uh, uh, ancient Carthago uh, and also in Israel. And they made um, hollow sculptures of Moloch. They made fire inside of Moloch's belly. And women were now sacrificing uh, children. They were throwing uh, children. So it's related to um, the newborn status. It's related to sacrifice. It's related to fire and so on. And if you look at it, this is the, uh, the, the fire in the belly of the Moloch. But you can also see it as a birth canal and the head of the child coming through towards you and the claws of Moloch uh, symbolize the pain uh, of the, of, of the uh, pressure. Now this is the same uh, sequence. You can see the body is still in fire, but now the head is breaking through 
and is connecting into uh, to a heavenly realm of a great mother goddess in a kind of a peacock heaven again we're encountering the the peacock here and the the, the goddess has dark complexion and there exist goddesses like that uh, for example saraswati in the hindu tradition is a great mother goddess closely connected with with uh, peacocks yeah. Again, you don't have to know the mythology to have the experience. Phoenix, very powerful symbol for death rebirth. Death of the old in fire, birth of the new, and making a spiritual connection. This was a shamanic experience of death rebirth, where it came as being devoured, torn to pieces by a pack of uh, wolves. This we know from the shamanic tradition I talked about, about about this yesterday that many shamans experience the ego death as being uh, devoured or destroyed by a, an initiatory animal jaguar in South America uh, grizzly bear in the American Northwest polar bear among the Inuit uh, Eskimo people and so on and then the idea is you sacrifice yourself to the animal and then the animal becomes your power animal in the shamanic tradition becomes a, a nagual as uh, Carlos Castaneda talked about it. This is another another sequence. Here actually uh, is a, 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 a goose, a, a gander, you know, very powerful shamanic animal in Siberian uh, uh, shamanism. And here is the resolution of that situation with the mummy where I told you to pay attention to the spider. This was somebody in our training, this is from, from the breathwork. She uh, had a severe phobia of heights and uh, for her, now she escaped from the realm of uh, this spider, you know, devouring mother and she is facing the light but for her it's not climbing to the light, she has to experience a fall. She was born in Prague, but she lives now in uh, the American Northwest, and she came to our training. Now, we were liberated by uh, the Red Army in 1945, and at that time, many of the uh, Soviet uh, soldiers stayed in people's homes, and she was a baby at the time, and they had a group of uh, the Soviet soldiers uh, living with them, and they were playing with her, you know, and as men, not, not very sensitive, sort of throwing her very high. And this is the situation where you really don't know if the child is enjoying it or uh, is frightened, you know, whether the child is laughing or you know, like the kind of fun that we get on a roller coaster, good roller coaster, you know, it, it's fun, but uh, yeah, no, not quite. So she discovered this is part of a coex system which was in her um, behind her phobia of heights. Here, there's a promise of transcendence with the angel, but she is still hanging on. She hasn't faced this feeling of falling. The, the feeling of falling somehow mysteriously is, uh, is also connected to the end of the birth process. And then finally, she allowed herself to have that experience. And this is the, res uh, this is the result. She talks about liberation, you can see at the bottom. Again, uh, something that is part of the shamanic lore, she experiences dismemberment. The old is falling apart. Uh, the new, is, new self is now emerging, and the new self has now a spiritual uh, connection. This is from a psilocybin session, from the, the alkaloid from the mushrooms. The, uh, new life coming out of uh, the old and there's something that you cannot translate in Russian there's a play on words because the flower is a carnation so it has connection to reincarnation uh, another experience of the bot bottom is a coffin uh, cemetery she is emerging from from this uh, merging with the light another experience of the last moment before being born 
the dark area, the scatological area, the divine light, the arms reaching for it, the tension here that was ex expressed in colors, red, yellow, orange. Here is represented by this wire or this string that's pulling it apart. The, we talked about fire already. Uh, this moment of rebirth is also in Kundalini Yoga would be opening of the heart chakra. And in the middle, the interesting symbol of rebirth, which is like a combination of a vaginal shape and a, a peacock ornament. And here it continues. It's, uh, the, the female uh, reproductive system is now actually transformed into a kind of a peacock. It becomes a celebration rather than something frightening. And this is the, the resolution of that series. As you can see her emerging from uh, her mother's uh, vagina. The vagina has kind of a peacock lining, as you can see. Uh, there is the fire that we already talked about. And now we see something very interesting. So the upper part is clearly the fourth matrix. Now she is now being born. Now, she described these hands as nourishing cosmic hands. Now you look at the hands, you look at the nails, they have the same patterns as, the, as her own vagina and the mother's vagina that she is coming out of. And we know the symbolism of the lower part, which is the star-filled sky. We saw that in the first matrix. So. Uh, the hands has, have to be also interpreted as having something to do with female uh, genitalia. So what happened here, the upper part is the fourth matrix. Uh, the uh, lower part is the first matrix where we are dealing with the, with the situation where the female genital was nourishing and supporting with the uterus uh, of, of the prenatal state. So what's missing here is the second and the third matrix. Very much like Harriet Francis, uh, you know, she was born with the, with the um, uh, sort of the image of the, of the peacock, and now after being born, she was back in the womb. But she was in the oceanic form of the womb. Here, the womb, the, in, in, the intrauterine situation is taking a, a, a cosmic, uh, form. We are almost there. <laughs> this is another version of the opening into the cosmos. I talked about uh, encountering not just one's own mother, but the great mother goddess. This was the picture of the great mother goddess who was just the mother of, of, of everything in nature. When people give me pictures like this, it's always with apologies. You know, the, this is, uh, uh, you know, this is nowhere close to the glory that I experience, but this is the best, this is the best I can do. A very, very fascinating picture from the holotropic breathwork training, giving birth to oneself. Many women who relive birth uh, are, are reliving simultaneously or in a kind of alternating fashion, giving birth, so maybe pushing with their head and then spreading the legs and, and uh, pushing as if they were giving birth. And then a successful resolution of that is giving birth to a new self, where uh, the woman is the one who gave birth, but also the one who was born. And this is associated with, you know, typically with a lot of healing and a lot of uh, positive transformation of personality. This is, uh, there was a question about caesarean birth. This is Jane English that we work with. And she actually wrote a book. She became so interested in caesarean birth, which was her own birth, that she did a big study with caesarean born people, if that's what you're interested in. And the book is called uh, uh, A Different Doorway, with the subtitle Adventures of a Caesarean Born. You can see she is just here, and suddenly there is an opening. The major trauma in caesarean birth is the rapidity of the transition. This happens within minutes, where if you go from one state, 
you know, without any transition suddenly to a completely new situation. So it's the power of the shock that is the trauma there rather than struggling with the pressures and, and uh, you know, with the choking and so on. Uh, this, is, uh, this was a Prague patient, male patient, approaching again the Divine Light and suddenly there was this menacing figure whom he called Golem, the figure from the, from the Jewish tradition that we know from, uh, you know, from Kafka and from Meiring, Meiring actually. Gustav Meiring wrote a book on, uh, about Golem, the artificial figure, robot who was created by Rabbi Lev and uh, was his servant but at one point got out of hand and started destroying things. So he's a symbol of a kind of, you know, blind destructive power. And it turned out to be a symbol of the ego death. He, he had to surrender and experience death before the way into the light was free as we see it here. So I have now four pictures that I usually use to close this uh, series. It's not from self-exploration, but I had given this talk in Copenhagen, uh, Copenhagen many, many years ago, and I came back two years later, and uh, there was an artist who was in the audience, and she gave me the, these paintings uh, as her own uh, a rendition of the perinatal matrices. So it's a nice way of rounding it all up. Uh, so this is her image of the first matrix. You can see that this, we are talking about archetypal sequence, which manifests in many other areas, not just birth. It's, you, can, you can see, uh, you know, the hatching of a bird. You could think about a situation of a society that is free, suddenly comes an oppressive regime that creates a no exit situation. You get a lot of abuse, uh, and you can't, you can't even leave, you know, they put, uh, <laughs> towers and uh, barbed wire and uh, German shepherds and submachine, people with submachine guns on the border so they don't let you out. So it creates a no exit situation. Then at a certain point, uh, people have enough of the oppression and uh, you know, it creates a revolution, enough of the oppression. We overthrow the tyrant. We will again breathe freely. And so there is a struggle there, uh, and then uh, there, there's a change. It's sort of a new, new uh, system develops. So this is, the, this is her third matrix, and this is her fourth matrix. Now this is something specifically related to uh, uh, Moscow when I was here um, in 2001 celebrating my um, my 70th birthday and uh, there's a meeting of, uh, of people from the Breathwork Network. Uh, we had a great dinner and uh, people were giving us uh, different gifts and there was a group of people and uh, I don't remember the name of the person. He uh, got up and he said, you know, uh, you keep talking about these perinatal matrices but where I come from, people are not born uh, out of vaginas. Uh, they are born out of cabbages. And I got this uh, uh, birthday gifts. <laughs> and finally, I have another one, which is typically, you know, specifically American. Um, as you know, Bush is related to a very strange group, very powerful group of uh, fundamentalist Christians who are um, a certain interpretation of the uh, of a certain passage about the Armageddon and so on, and they believe that uh, the, 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 they're trying to accelerate the destruction of the world because they believe they're going to be uh, taken to Jesus when uh, they are going to have a rapture. Uh, and uh, you know, some of these people got into the government and so on. And one of the manifestations of that is that they're trying to. Uh, get a situation where the, uh, the, uh, the uh, um, uh, sort of the creationist idea, uh, which is the, 
that the, the universe was created uh, 6,000 years ago, you know, instantly in its totality, would be taught at, uh, in American schools together with the theory of evolution. They want it to become <laughs> a mandatory uh, uh, subject at American schools. So after Bush made that demand, uh, there was a wonderful cartoon uh, that appeared in the San Francisco Chronicle. Uh, I don't know if you can see it in the back, but they, there's a, you know, Bush pointing to a stork bringing a baby, and he is saying, and according to another theory of human reproduction. So um, that's the that's the final final uh, picture of the of the series.